Warning, this video may upset certain people because I'm going to show you the three worst punishments in all of the Bible. Number one, King Agrippa was punished for pride. Herod Agrippa was the king over all of Judea for three years and one day he fell out with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Now the scripture doesn't tell us what this argument was about but many Bible scholars believe it's to do with the trading of food. You see, Tyre and Sidon were just seaports and they didn't have a lot of farmland. But on the other hand, Judea had many crops, lots of farmland, and somewhere it's believed that they had a falling out. Now, whatever the reason was for this falling out, there's one thing we do know, and it's this. King Agrippa found a solution. He brought reconciliation to both sides. And because of it, the people of Judea loved him. And one day, King Agrippa presented himself before the crowds. He was wearing his royal robes. He sat on his throne and he gave an address. And because the people were so starstruck with his message, they cried out, This is the voice of God and not a man. Agrippa had two choices. He could either correct the people, just like Paul and Barnabas did when they were being worshipped, and say to them, stop it guys, stop it at once. I am just a fallen human being like you are. You must not worship me. Or the second option is, he could keep quiet. He could let the people believe that he was some kind of deity and he could rob the glory of God. Well, sadly, King Agrippa chose the latter choice. And what happened next will make your stomach churn. Are you ready for it? The Bible says, then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. So here is this king who thought he was something special and he died the most humiliating death. Some kind of parasite likely gnawed at his insides and there his three year reign ended. Three years and now King Agrippa is forgotten. And I can guarantee one thing to you, if you go into your local town and you walk on the streets and you ask people who was Herod Agrippa, I guarantee 99% of the people will never have heard of him. But if you go on the streets and you ask the same people, have you heard of Jesus Christ? I guarantee that 99% of the people have heard of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the next verse in the Bible says, but the word of God grew and multiplied. So Herod lost his reign after three years, but the word of God the glory of God continued because heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word, the Bible, will never pass away. So let that be a warning to you and I that somewhere there is an invisible line. There is an invisible line between God's patience and God's wrath and King Agrippa crossed that line. So let you and I beware that every time we have a good gift, every time we have a win, every time we have a success, that we're always attributing it back up to the Lord God and saying, no, not me. Don't give glory to me in my name. Give glory to the Most High God because everything comes from His hand, the good and the bad. It's all from the sovereign Lord of the universe. The legend of Jeremy Lin continues. Take us through that last shot. He was trying to push me left and he backed up a little bit and I just thank my Lord, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for that shot, man. That was uh, thankful, thankful that it went in. Let me let you into a secret. When I first saw that clip, I didn't really know how to process it because I wasn't sure, can we really give thanks for something as trivial as a basketball game? When there's all these serious things going on in the world, can we really sort of say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for that? And then this verse entered into my mind. He holds all things together, even the three-point line. And praise God that he isn't saying it was my skill that made that three-point shot. No, I give all the praise, all the glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two. Absalom was punished for his rebellion against his parents. In the Bible, we often read about people who were beautiful. Joseph was beautiful, Rachel was, David was ruddy and good looking, but there's none in the Bible who is described more elaborately than Absalom. The scripture says, now in all Israel, there was no one who was praised as much as Absalom for his good looks. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, 
there was no blemish in him. Every year, Absalom would take part in a rather unusual ritual. Because his hair was so thick, because it was so luscious, because it was so long, and I can see you laughing at me right now, because his hair was so, if you like, beautiful, do you know what he'd do? He'd get a razor and he'd shave it off. Once he had all of the hair together, he'd put it in one big clump and then he'd weigh it. Guess how much his hair weighed? It was 200 shekels, which is about the same weight as a bag of flour. In other words, Absalom's beauty went to his head. We've all met the person who is really very attractive and we know them and we've seen how getting lots of validation, getting lots of praise has gone to their head. It's filled them with an ego that is very unsightly at times and that's what I believe happened to Absalom. I believe if he's being told all the time, you are the most beautiful man in Israel, it filled him with a sense of self-importance where eventually he believed that he truly would be a better king than God's appointed man, David. He thought he should be on the throne instead. And just like any over ambitious person, just like anyone who's jealous, Absalom went to great lengths to deceive people, to try and win the people of Israel, David's people, for himself, so that he would get more fame and more glory. This was Absalom's plan. Early in the morning, he would stand by the city gate, and there he would take advantage of people who'd come to see King David. They'd come with their problems, with their complaints, and Absalom would say to them, I'm sorry. Oh, I am sorry. The king's too busy to see you today. He doesn't have time for you and your problems. But if I was on the throne, if I ruled, I would make sure you were treat fairly. I'd make sure you were listened to. And each person he made feel like a million dollars. Each person he kissed and flattered to win them onto his side. Absalom pretended that he cared about the people, but he didn't care. His all he cared about was his clout, his name, and building up an empire for himself. Eventually, the news leaked into David's ears that Absalom, his son, had gathered a rather large following and the people wanted him to be king and he was going to take his place. So David, out of fear, went into hiding for the second time in his life. But there came a point where David felt, I cannot hide any longer. I cannot flee with my people any longer. They're tired, they're weary. We must go to battle. So he mustered a number of men before him. And before those men went out into battle, before they went out against the rebellion of the people who'd rebelled against King David, he gave them one order. Deal gently with the young man Absalom for my sake. And friends, my dear friends, I see that as a beautiful picture of our father. Here we are, his sons, his daughters, and we've run away. We've rebelled. We're the ones in the wrong. We're the ones who deserve to be wiped out. And yet God says, I want to deal gently with you because I am a gentle God. And very often when I look around at the world and I see the pride in men's hearts, I often ask the question, Lord, when are you going to finish? is off. When is your judgment going to come? Because I fear at how arrogant men and women have become. And then I remember God is a gentle God. And that truly is the reason why I believe we've been allowed to continue in so much immorality for such a long time. But remember, remember King Agrippa. He crossed that invisible line. And there is a day when mercy is cut off. So if you are sitting on the fence and you have not made a decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and you've got your foot in the world and all this wickedness. Repent now and turn to Christ while we are still in the day of grace. Okay, back to the story. The battle between Absalom's men and David's men took place in a forest in Ephraim. And because the Lord was with David, he started to overpower the men of Israel, those who'd drawn their allegiance to Absalom. And Absalom, this is the gruesome bit, Absalom was pelting through the forest on his mule when suddenly his long, thick, luscious hair got caught on a branch. And he's hanging there on this branch and his mule carries on riding. So here he is, Absalom, caught, hanging there, captive by this branch. 
Isn't that fascinating? You see, the one thing that filled Absalom with self-importance, the one thing that everyone worshipped him for, became the one thing that caused his downfall. The scripture is right, is it not, when it says, Pride comes before destruction. And there Absalom hung for David's most brutal warrior, Joab, who unfortunately did not listen to the king, and there he arrived with ten men and finished off the young man Absalom for his disobedience. Number three, Jesus was punished not for any crime he committed, but for us. And I would argue, if you look at all the punishments, at all the ways to die, there is no way that is more painful than to be crucified. In fact, because Jesus knew what the cross meant, because he knew the physical suffering and the spiritual suffering he was about to endure, the Bible actually says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now this isn't Luke, the writer, having artistic license. No, Luke was a physician and he was describing a real medical condition called hematidrosis. And if you don't take my word for it, listen to this modern day doctor describe it. Yeah, I, I believe that Christ's suffering and the demonstration of the kind of physiologic stress that his human body was under uh, is manifested in the Garden of Gethsemane where it's described that he was sweating blood. There is a well-documented uh, medical condition in which patients who are under tremendous amount of emotional stress and physiological stress can in fact sweat blood because little blood vessels within the glands burst and, the, and then the blood is expressed. Before Jesus was crucified, the Bible tells us he was flogged. Now the way the Romans used to flog people was really rather barbaric. You see, they would have a handle, and on the handle were seven strips of leather. And attached to each strip was bits of broken up glass, bits of nail, bits of bone. So as they whipped the person, it would take with them a, a chunk of flesh. They'd whip it, draw it back in, until literally chunks of tissue and muscle were drawn away from the bone. After they flogged the Lord Jesus Christ, after he was beaten, they took him and they told him, you must carry your cross. So the Lord Jesus did the very best he could, but there came a point where physically he could not take another step. He collapsed under the weight of the cross and a man, Simon the Cyrene, had to carry it for him. Eventually, they both reached Golgotha, the place of the skull, and when Jesus arrived, the Roman soldiers took the garments off him and there he stood, ashamed totally bare. And then they took my saviour and they nailed him to a cross. Now very often in the paintings, in the books, in the movies, we see that Jesus Christ had nails through the very centre of his foot. But actually that's not totally accurate because very recently archaeologists found an artefact of a person's foot who had been crucified and it proved that the nail actually went through the side of the foot rather in the ankle that would hold them in place. And if you ask doctors they can confirm that anatomically it is still classed as the foot. So the scripture is still very much fulfilled that says they pierced my hands and my feet. See him there, the innocent one, hanging on that cross. His back is lacerated, pressed up against a horrible, rugged, rough cross. And there he hangs, there ashamed. On top of that, remember he had a crown of thorns smashed into his skull. And these thorns weren't tiny little thistles that we might see on a rose bush. No, the plant that is believed to have been used had thorns that were between one and two inches long. And then Isaiah writes that they plucked out the Lord Jesus Christ's beard. They plucked out the Messiah's beard. And could it be when those soldiers mocked him, when they struck him and said, prophesy to us, O Christ. Tell us who struck you. Could it be as they slapped him, they took with it a chunk of his beard. There he is, ashamed, bleeding there, dying. What you probably didn't know is that crucifixion was death 
by suffocation. If every single one of you just opens your arms out like this for a moment, you'll notice it becomes harder to exhale. Now imagine that for hours on end, for days on end, just holding your arms out like that. Slowly, the oxygen levels in your body decrease and you're slowly suffocating to the point where your lungs get damaged and your heart gets damaged, which can even lead to the heart bursting, which is called cardiac rupture. And that is why many doctors believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died from a heart attack whilst he was on the cross. But here's the question every single one of you should be asking right now. Why did the Lord Jesus Christ have to endure such a terrible punishment? What was the crime that he committed that he would have to suffer such horrific death? What did he do? The answer is nothing. The Lord Jesus Christ never committed any sin. He never laid his hands on anyone to hurt them, so he did not deserve the nails through his hands. He never ran away to places or walked into places he should not be with his feet, so he did not deserve the nails through his feet. He never thought a wrong, wicked, unclean thought like we do on a daily basis, so he did not deserve the crown of thorns. The Lord Jesus Christ was totally obedient to God, and you and I, as we know, have totally been disobedient to our God. But what I'm gonna say next will shock some of you. But did you know this? Those physical sufferings that we've just described are not the worst part of the cross. That was not the worst part of the suffering that Jesus endured. No, the spiritual suffering was far worse. The Bible says between the sixth and the ninth hour, darkness fell on the land. And between those three hours, Jesus cried with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in those three hours, God poured out all of his wrath, all of his judgment on Jesus Christ. It's almost as if God the Father rolled up his sleeves and he reached into every person's heart in the world and he pulled out all of the rebellion, all of the grime, all of the sin, all of the pride, all of the vanity, all that sin, he put it in one big ball and he embedded it on the Lord Jesus Christ. And there he crushed the Lord, there he bruised him, there he punished him, there the wrath that was on us, that abides on all of us, all of us sons and daughters of disobedience, that wrath was turned away from us and it was turned onto Jesus Christ. In that one moment, that finite moment, all the sins of the world were put on him. And there he paid the price. There justice was done because God felt it was acceptable, this sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that Christ died in my room, in my stead. He stood there so that I could be forgiven. And if you remember just one thing from this video, please remember this. Jesus did that because he loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. No one pushed him to go to the cross. No one forced him to do that. No, Jesus says, I have laid down my life willingly because I love you. And he did that so that he might have a relationship, a friendship with you. And you know the story well. You know he died. He died this terrible death. But on the third day, he conquered the grave. And now he's in heaven and he's gone to prepare a place for all those who love the Lord Jesus back. And one day that love will be enjoyed in heaven for all of eternity. And I want to know, will you be part of that love? Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Maybe right now, in this very moment as I've shared everything that Jesus did for you you feel that your heart like John Wesley was said about him his heart was strangely warmed perhaps there's something strange going on in you right now where you feel yes I really do think I love the Lord Jesus Christ well if that's happening right now I plead with you turn from your sins turn from your evilness turn from your wrongdoing and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the forgiveness of sins receive that redemption that reconciliation that was paid for with his own blood and if you're still confused on how do I become a Christian? I don't understand, Joe. Please go and watch this video because I truly do believe it might just change your life forever if you have not yet bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ.